morning. Um, the year 2019 marks a big milestone in space anniversaries. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon 50 years ago. Here in CAFAS, we will celebrate this anniversary through April. And today we meet here to talk about the um, importance of space exploration and how it symbolize, symbolizes what we can do as humans if we work together. Uh, we will start first with a young uh, Kuwaiti who is very keen on space and he's very ambitious and would like to go to the space one day. Ghanim is the, uh, the uh, regional coordinator for the Middle East region and he works with the um, Space Generation Advisory Council. He is also managing the Moon Village workshop uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, please um, welcome Ghanim. He will talk to you about his uh, um, experience in the uh, Mars station. Thank you, Dr. Ahala. Thank you very much for having me uh, talking about uh, my uh, adventure as an analog astronaut at the Mars Desert Research Station. So first, um, I would like to speak, I would like to tell you about uh, why analog missions are important for space exploration. I'm going to talk Arabic and English. يعني راح اتكلم اللغتين علشان واي شيء اي وانا قاعد اتكلم تقدرون ترفعون ايدكم تسالوني ما في اي مشكله اوكي فانا كنت في فبراير اللي طاف انا كنت رائد فضاء محاكي كنت خلال اسبوعين قاعد نسوي ابحاث علميه واوتريتش يعني حق الببليك خلال مهمه محاكيه للمريخ وكأن احنا عايشين على سطح المريخ. فانا راح اتكلم في البدايه ليش هذا مهم؟ ليش المحاكيات هذه مهمه؟ أه والشيء الثاني بعدين راح اتكلم عن المهمه مالتنا أه بالتفصيل اكثر. سبيس اكسبلوريشن، احنا لما نتكلم عن سبيس كلمه سبيس احنا قاعد نتكلم عن توبكس وايد. أه أه قاعد نتكلم عن سبيس ابلكيشنز مثلا اللي هو له علاقه <تصفيق> Communication satellites, remote sensing, قاعد نتكلم عن space medicine. من ضمنها space exploration, استكشاف الفضاء. استكشاف الفضاء من أغلى من أكثر المهمات الفضائية تكلفة. تكلفتها جدا عالية. صعب نقنع المؤسسات أن هي تدعم فلوس علشان تدعم استكشاف الفضاء. إذا بنحط عامل الإنسان فيها، إذا بنسوي مهمات فضاء فيها بشر، هذه بتصير أصعب وأصعب بعد. فلأن مكلفة ولأن لأن مكلفة ولأن سبيس اكسبلوريشن ريسكي خطر جدا مهم جدا ان نسوي الانالوج ميشنز محاكيات للفضاء اوكي سو ذاتس واي انالوج ميشنز ار امبورتنت بيكوز بيكوز وي نيد تو هاف Uh, uh, we need to accumulate knowledge. We need to understand more about space exploration. Space exploration is so expensive and so risky. There are many analog habitats around the world. Muhakiyat. There are uh, there are many analog habitats around the world. For example, high seas here. This is a habitat in Hawaii, and there are the Nemo, the Hira. Among the many uh, habitats around the world is. Uh, the Mars Desert Research Station. This was one of the first habitats ever. It was established in 2001, and uh, activities at MDRS aim at informing the public and contributing uh, to the research in support to future space mission. This is what we have done uh, as a crew. This is what we did actually. And uh, our crew was 205, so there, there were more than 200 crews since 2001. Uh, my rotation start started last February, in the 8th of February, and we stayed for two weeks in complete confinement. So we were, we were for example, this picture is illegal. I mean, I mean it, we, are, we were not allowed to go outside without wearing the spacesuit. This was after the simulation. 
So we were in a complete confinement, very limited food, very lim limited water resources, uh, very, very limited internet connections. Um, uh, we were eight international young professionals and students from different countries around the world. I will tell you more about my crewmates. And we, we've done several research projects and outreach projects. Um, and some of the projects were supported by Florida Institute of Technology and the other projects supported by uh, the European Space Agency. So those are my crewmates. This is our logo. If you see, there are five flags. Germany, Maria, she was the crew journalist and she is a payload engineer at the European Space Agency. She is responsible on integrating um, payload, uh, science payload from different universities, so they send it to the ISS. From Kuwait, I was the crew astronomer. Um, I will tell you more about my role uh, in astronomy uh, in a while. Uh, Spain, we have two uh, uh, team members from Spain. We have Natalia and Veronica. Natalia was our commander, and she's a consultant at Euroconsult. It's a private company. She, she knows about the future trend of space missions. Uh, Veronica, she's an intern at ESA ESTEC in, in Netherlands. From the UK, we have uh, Daniel. Uh, he is a colleague of Veronica, and uh, both of them are interns uh, at ESA ESTEC. And we have the three Americans, uh, David, uh, eight years he worked in the US uh, Army, and he's now doing his uh, degree in astrobiology. We have Nathan right here, and Hannah. They are also doing their uh, degree in astrobiology. So, as you just saw, um, we had different rules, but uh, one of the main research we've, we've done is uh, uh, the leadership uh, survey or uh, uh, the human factor in a, in a space mission. Uh, Natalia was the leader for seven, for the, the, the main commander, but she was actually leading for only seven days because we were rotating rules. So I was the leader or I was the commander for one day and I was the executive officer for another day. Um, this was the same for every uh, member in the team. So in the end, uh, Natalia became a commander for one week and David became an executive officer only for one week. Um, we were actually examining the leadership styles, different leadership styles because we came from different cultures, different backgrounds, um, and uh, we were filling up surveys. One of the survey were adapted from literature, so th it was our own survey. And other surveys were from uh, BHD uh, uh, researchers from Europe. Um, so this was one of the main research projects. The other research, the, the other operation is extravehicular activity. هذا لما كنا نطلع برا الهابيتات لما نلبس السبيس سوت ونطلع برا يسمونها extravehicular activity. This took uh, really a big fraction of our time during the simulator. Uh, we developed uh, safety and operational procedures and guidelines. If you are simulating a mission to Mars, you will start to notice some details. It's important to write that down those details. We have in situ resource utilization. This is a big topic and it's getting even more important in the future. How to utilize resources if you are in moon. There are materials, uh, metals, you know, uh, elements how to utilize those materials to support astronauts living either in, in, in the moon or in the Mars. So basically what we were doing, we were going for an EVA and we were collecting some uh, samples and we were using those samples to grow some plants in the green hub. I will show you now. Astronomy, this is my primary part. This is what I, I, I am doing. Naam. Yes. 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 So they're quite different from the samples that we collected on Mars. Definitely. What's your relationship to it? This is a simulation. So we are, we are performing uh, uh, duties and uh, research as if we are living in Mars. 
we are, I mean, w when we are doing the, uh, the, the procedure of going outside the hub, taking the samples, and going back, uh, standing in the airlock with the sample, mm -hmm. how we are handling the so sample. So you're just practicing the procedure. You're, you're not worried about the outcomes, because the outcomes are going to be different, right? The, yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, d d of course, d definitely, because because the samples are actually from the Utah desert, okay. from from the ground. Okay. But we are practicing how we are doing that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So astronomy. I was doing astronomy photometry. This means measuring uh, the light coming from the star. I was using the observatory in the in the habitat. There is an observatory, 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain uh, telescope. And, and uh, by measuring the, uh, the, the brightness of this star over a period of time, we can understand the physical and chemical properties of the stars. I was doing that with the association of the American Association of Variable Stars Observers. Um, we also did some outreach, and that's why I am here, actually. So this is how the habitat looks like. <coughs> this is the main hub. This is where we used to live. The, the first floor here, where you have the window, is where we used to sleep, uh, our rooms. The ground floor is where we store our uh, spacesuits, the toilet. Um, right here is the green hub where we used to grow our plants. Uh, this is the science dome. <coughs> there are some equipments, and this is the observatories. And they are all connected with the tunnel. So we used to wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning. We prepare our own breakfast. This is a normal setup uh, kitchen, oven, refrigerator, just a normal kitchen. And here we, we, we used to live. Um, we used to have two AVAs every day. We, we were eight, so the first EVA consists of four members, and then they come back, and then the other four go out. Here. We used to store our suits. There are two designs of the space suits. And here we used to sleep. If you see the design down here, um, uh, the two rooms are actually overlapping. So one, one crew member used to sleep up here, which is equivalent. I mean, he is sleeping actually above the other room. And the other guy is sleeping down here. It's, it's a good design because it, it also provides some privacy. So it was really small place. I mean, it was difficult to live in that situation. Um, as I just mentioned, we were living in a very limited resources. Um, and daily activities are divided into research projects and uh, 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 outreach. Every day, we need to submit reports to the, to the Capcom. The, 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 the Capcom windows opens at 7 PM, and it ends at 9 PM. So for example, I am the crew astronomer. I need to write every day what I'm, I'm doing in astronomy and submit it. The crew engineer, the same for everyone. So I'm going to speak here briefly about the extravehicular activity. Uh, first, we need to plan for our extravehicular activity, where we want to go. If it's more than one kilometer, then we need to take different majors. If it's smaller than one kilometer away from the, the hub, we need to take different majors. And then we need to ask for a request from the Capcom and wait for the confirmation for our plan. And then we need to pre prepare for this EVA. Um, this is my, myself. I am, I am helping uh, Daniel to wear his space suit. Um, and then we do uh, the EVA. This is a picture uh, for us in the light, in the, in the uh, airlock, where we de depressurize, I mean, in a real mission, we depressurize and then we go outside. We need to stay for five minutes. I mean, in real, of course, in real situation, it's more than that. But in our simulation, it's, it was only five minutes. And then we do the uh, mission, and then we come back to our, our reports. So this is actually my favorite picture. I was the guy down here. I am down here. So this is like one kilometer, one kilometer away from the hub. And we were able to communicate with the hub so, because the communication range is one kilometer. We told them we are here in the, we call this one the, the, the North Ridge. And they took this amazing picture of us. This was my second, my second EVA. 
Here I am, I am number eight, and this is our electrical vehicle. We use it if we are going far away from the hub. Um, this is an all ladies picture, and this is how we take the sample. This is how we take the samples. So, I would like also to tell you about a very interesting uh, finding. This is an actual fossilized shell. We found it in the Utah desert. We are not the first, but it was very interesting to know that uh, this is a fossilized, fossilized uh, shell from a geological era that was very ancient when there was a sea, actually, in the Utah desert. Um, and I, I would like also to, to introduce you to Goose. This is our ninth member, and he's our, our outreach guy. We've, we've done several, several videos um, uh, for outreach, and Goose introduced all our rules. So you can, you can learn about our rules um, from Goose. Uh, our videos will be uploaded very soon in YouTube, so I invite you all to, uh, um, to watch them. In the end, everyone can apply, different backgrounds, different uh, ages, quite competitive, but um, uh, the experience deserve, deserve uh, the application, and uh, if you want to apply, you can always come, come to me. So uh, thank you very much. Ghanem is with us here, and um, he's also holding this event. So if you are interested in developing Kuwait's strategy for peaceful usage of space, talk to him. He will be here. Um, and again, this program is for youth of Kuwait who are interested in space. Um, it gives me great honor today to present Nagin Cox, senior engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She is uh, also managing multiple interdisciplinary, um, interplanetary robotic missions, including the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab uh, Galileo mission to explore Jupiter the Mars Exploration Rover missions, and the Kepler telescope, uh, telescope mission to search for Earth-like Earth -like planets around the stars. Cox is a mission lead on the operation team of Mars Science Laboratory, which probably a lot of you have heard about the Mars Curiosity Rover that landed in 2012 on Mars and is still exploring it. Please welcome with us uh, Nagin Cox. Okay, hi everybody. So as we're switching presentations here, as you said, my name is Nagi Cox and I'm an engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I am super honored to be here today at the invitation of the American Embassy. And I've had a chance to speak to audiences in Saudi Arabia and uh, to come back to Kuwait. I was actually in Kuwait last year uh, and I, it turns out that I was here just a few weeks before, so I left. Thank you for setting that slide up. I was here, and a few weeks after I left, the AS, uh, ASCC opened. Like, I just missed it. And how many of you have been there? Yes, been to the AS. I see big hands over there. So the ASCC, the Cultural Center, has a, um, uh, has a space museum. And in it is this giant model, a scale model of the Mars Curiosity rover, which I work on. And so when the ambassador saw that, he was like, oh, you have to come back and talk in, uh, near where there's the big model. And so that, that was part of the reason that I came back on my way back from Saudi Arabia. And so you guys have a huge resource in the ASCC. That's a wonderful museum. I got a chance to see it yesterday, the Space Museum. Uh, a, lot of the a lot of the information is something I'll be talking about. Also what Gautam was talking about in terms of uh, the preparation for human exploration. So that's a, a resource that you guys have. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about what it's like to work on one of these robotic space missions and, and then talk about a little bit about my background and hopefully we'll have lots of time for your questions. So a little bit about science and exploration. So I'm going to start with a video. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I prefer to wander around, but um, so I'm going to start with video. And this video is going to be about the landing day for Curiosity. So Curiosity is our current rover on Mars, and I'm part of the operations team, so I will tell you now, I'm one of the mission leads, and I'm on the team that's responsible for commanding the rover every day. Uh, when I'm on duty. The other job that I have is I'm currently on the, the head of the engineering, the, one of the deputy team chiefs of the engineering operations team for the Mars 2020 rover, the one that we're going to send next year. But we're going back to August 5th of 2012. And this is when Curiosity landed. You will see all of us in mission control at JPL in Pasadena, California. And the reason I show this is because it's not what you may think when you think of science and engineering. We did not know if this complicated landing sequence was going to work. We were attempting to land a rover on Mars, and you know, Mars is still super risky. Two out of three missions to Mars fail. Two out of three still fail. And we were using a brand new landing system. We didn't know if it was going to work. So we are in the control room watching data come back from Mars to tell us whether the landing sequence was working. Some of what you'll see is an animation and some of it is actual pictures from that day. So it's us and the people around the world. A lot of this is folks in the United States who, was wa who are watching us. But again, as you watch it, see if this is it, it, when you have a picture of space exploration, when you have a picture of what scientists and engineers do, see if this is what you think of. And if we could, and if we could turn it up. Things are looking good. Coming up on the tree. It will report to entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle has just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Yes. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers and descending. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs>
So that's a really fun video to share. I enjoy looking back on that. Uh, but also, so the reason I show that is because it shows that it's a team of people that get something done, right? There are very few things that, that we work on in this day and age that, don't, that we just work on by ourselves, right? It's always a team of people. All right, so now I'll give you some background. And you know, if there's any way to dim, leave just a few of these lights off just so they can see the slides. So I put this one in here because I always, I always forget um, to talk about my background. So my name before I got married was Zainab Nagi Ahmed. That's, that's me. And uh, I was uh, raised in a, born in a Muslim family. And my, I, was, I was born in India. My parents are from India, are from India. And I grew up primarily in Malaysia, in Malaysia, but also in the center of the United States in Kansas. So as I was growing up, I developed a, I've wanted to work at JPL on these robotic missions since I was 14, right? But it didn't, also, it didn't always start out that way. My, you know, I think I originally wanted to be like a ballerina, right? Um, uh, but then I noticed that in my house, um, I was surprised to find that there seemed to be a difference between what the boys were expected to do and what the girls were expected to do. And I thought, wait, what, right? And like my brothers were expected to go to a school that was good in math and science, and I was supposed to go to a school that was good in the arts and humanities. And I thought, well, I wanna to go to the same school as my brothers, right? And so none of this made any sense. And I was like, you know, <coughs> nine or so at the time, nine or 10. And so once, you've, once you experience, you know, people, uh, uh, ways to separate people, you start noticing it elsewhere. And so even though I was like 10, you know, I started to see that people would say things about where it mattered, like what race you were, what religion. And, and then I just remember thinking, well, why do we separate ourselves? And at the time that I was growing up was also the middle uh, of the Apollo missions. And so at the same time, as I was seeing ways that people divide ourselves, I was also seeing these moon landings and missions where people all over the world were like watching television screens and these things would be in the newspapers of the entire world. And so I, it was clear to me that here was something that, peop, that brought people together, not separated them. So I decided, oh, I want to work for the space program. I want to work for something that brings people together. And I first, and then, I, so I knew I needed to be an engineer to do that. So I didn't start out saying, oh, I'm gonna be an engineer, then see what job I could get. I did, I, I kind of went the other way. I wanted to work for NASA and then said, ah, then I need to be an engineer. And math and science were not like easy for me, right? I just knew that that was what I needed to do. So then, and one of the shows that was on at that time was Cosmos with Carl Sagan, and it was the original Cosmos, it's, it's being repeated now, but this show talked about space and astronomy, and also it was my first uh, exposure to robotic space exploration. So I never wanted to be an astronaut because the astronauts don't go very far, right? At the time that I was growing up, they're kind of stuck in Earth orbit. And so I wanted to go, I wanted to explore further. And there was this television show called Cosmos that talked about this amazing place called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And at the end, you know, when, when the show finished on Sunday night, at the end of the show, it would say, Carl Sagan, um, Cornell University. And so I went, aha. I shall go to Cornell University, right? And I decided I'm gonna to try to go to Cornell. And, but I didn't have any money because the money for education for college in, that, in my family was for the boys. And so I said, oh, okay, so I need to get a scholarship. So I was very lucky and I got a scholarship from the United States Air Force and I served in, and they paid for my undergraduate education and my graduate, and I loved it. I loved being in the Air Force. I loved serving my country, you know, the duty on our country. And I, I was in for about six years as an officer. Then I, then I said, okay, this is wonderful, but I gotta get to NASA, right? So um, I got out and uh, I left the Air Force and I applied to NASA and I heard nothing. 
like nothing happened, right? And so I failed in my first attempt to join JPL. And then, so I went to work for IBM and got some further experience and learn more about how to, you know, improve my resume, know who the right people were. And then the next time I applied, uh, I was able to get in. So I've been at JPL now for 25 years. And <laughs> you know, I have to say, I have to say Arab audiences are so polite. When I say that, you guys clap. Other places they go, oh, you're so old. Right. <laughs> and of course, I think I also go, wait, how did it turn into 25 years? But when you've worked on multiple missions, you know, for four or five years each, then voila, you know, then it off you go. Um, OK, so just a little bit of context. So when most people think of the space program, they think of the astronauts and the space station and the space shuttle. But did we have any success dimming these lights? No. Um, OK, so. And that's true that, uh, it is true that that is the most common, right, is, is, uh, is uh, thinking about astronauts. And we're not just talking about NASA here, right? There are many space agencies around the world, including uh, Kuwait, and now very recently the Saudi Space Commission has just been formed. And we all have mul multiple different missions, right? And so the first one is to, we want to learn about our planet. It's not just about exploring space. We want to learn about our planet. We want to prepare for human exploration. You heard Ghanim talk about that with some of the, the steps you have to take before you're ready to send people beyond low Earth orbit back to the moon or to Mars. And then the third is to find out, is there life anywhere else in the solar system? So those are kind of the three areas that NASA works on. So JPL stands for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. There are multiple NASA centers located throughout the United States. You might have heard of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida where we launch our rockets. The astronauts live and train in Houston, but today we'll talk about JPL. So JPL is run for NASA by Caltech, California Institute of Technology. So I'm an employee of the California Institute of Technology, but I'm a NASA engineer. So how many of you watch The Big Bang Theory? See, I'm always amazed at the amount of hands that go up. So for those of you who, who didn't raise your hands, The Big Bang Theory is a US television show about scientists and engineers who work at Caltech. So I work at Caltech, and I just have to tell those of you who watch it, we're not that bad. <laughs> Right, we are nerdy and we're engineers, but we're not that bad, right? But it, I think like this week, it's, it becomes one of the longest running television shows ever in the US and, and it's also almost the number one show around the world. And it's about scientists and engineers, right? So how cool is that? Uh, so JPL, let's see, I have this little interesting pointer thingy. Uh, so this is, the building that you saw the video in right here, that's the operations building. There are about 6,000 people who work at JPL. And our charter is the robotic exploration of the solar system and beyond. So before we send people, we send robots. Before we send astronauts, we send robots. And this is what motivated me to be involved in this. I mean, some of those images you see, well, all those images you see up there are from the robotic spacecraft. And so when I was in school and we were seeing pictures come back from the Voyager spacecraft, from Voyager and Pioneer, these were some of the first time we had ever seen images of these planets. And so that's when I realized that if you really wanted to go where no one has gone before, that would be the robots because we need to understand other planets before we send people. So we will send spacecraft to go into orbit around them and, and make a map and understand what the system is like, all the steps that are necessary if you're going to send people. We have now completed our initial reconnaissance of the solar system, meaning that we have been at least once to every planet in our solar system will include Pluto, it's an honorary planet. Mm -hmm. And so now we're learning how to go back and go back more frequently and start landing on planets and become more familiar with them. So Mars exploration is, so Mars 
one of our you know, nearest planetary neighbors, is always of great interest to us and everyone around the world because it's close, it's a possibility for human exploration. When we started exploring Mars in the 1970s, it, sorry, in the 1960s, it really was a U.S.-Soviet Union thing, right? It started out as part of the space race, being less about exploration and more about um, uh, politics, right? And then after that has, we moved on from that into actual exploration finding out what Mars is like. And as you can see, there are now many flags that are up on that screen. We are, uh, like next year, so we go to Mars about every two years because that's when the launch window is opens. The Earth and Mars are at their closest point together about every 24 months. So that's a good time to go. It takes less energy, less data rate. I mean, the data rates are higher, et cetera. So you'll hear people talk about going to Mars every, uh, approximately every two years. And next year, so we have, so China, Japan, the Europeans, Great Britain, India has sent an orbiter to Mars. Next year, the UAE will send the HOPE mission. That's a mission that's being, where NASA's providing assistance and uh, the UAE is, is getting going on sending their own mission. So that's great to have the, the Middle East join the, pick, the party. Okay, so landing on Mars. Again, when you've done enough exploration, the, when you've seen a place for a while, you want to get, you want to land. So imagine trying to learn what Kuwait was like if, if you're basically flying over it all the time. Then at some point you think, well, I'm not really going to know what it's like unless I, unless I land and drive around. So that's what we have, what we started to do in Mars. First landing was in 1976. It is not easy, right? And as you saw from that video. So first we put landers down, literally landers that land and don't go anywhere. Then we said, okay, you know, if we're really going, it'd be like landing in one place in Kuwait and then saying, aha, I know what all of the earth is like, right? You need mobility. You need to be able to drive around. So that's when we started with our Mars, with our rovers. And so I'm going to take questions at the end, uh, just because uh, otherwise um, I, I will not finish on time because I will tell too many stories. Right. So we started with Mars Pathfinder in 1997. First rover, not much taller than my knee, and she probably didn't go any further than this room. That's because that was an engineering demonstration. We were trying to figure out how to send a rover, how to deploy it, how to command it. And after we figured that part out, we said, okay, now let's send rovers with a science objective. So in the center is a, a picture of, is a, a, an artist uh, rendering of Spirit and Opportunity. Those were the two rovers, those were the first two rovers that I worked on, and we landed in 2004. Spirit and Opportunity, their job was to find out, was there ever water on Mars? Liquid water on Mars in the past. So these missions, so what Ghanem was talking about is more on the side of the human exploration. These robotic missions that I work on are under the Science Mission Directorate of NASA. So that means that we have some human exploration objectives, like we try to move the knowledge that we need for human exploration forward. But we are also trying to answer science questions. And so the science questions here was, was there ever water on Mars in the past? Now, Spirit and Opportunity were supposed to last for three months. Three months in 2004. Spirit lasted for six years and Opportunity for 15. So we are very proud of that. And Oppie just stopped, stopped uh, we declared end of mission for Oppie last month. So that was a little bit sad for us. And now Curiosity, the one that you saw that landed in 2012, her job was to find out, actually, I think I have a big, oh yes, big picture of uh, Curiosity. This is our badass rover that we've got on Mars right now. And uh, she's huge. She's about the size of a small car. And her job is to find out, once we knew there was water on Mars, was the water there long enough to create an environment for life? So what does that mean? Right. If you were to take a, a bucket, when you go home tonight, if you took a bucket with water and you put it out on your back porch, and then you come back tomorrow and you look at the water, you're like, the water looks the same, no change. Let's say you come back in two months and, um, 
uh, and because it's like Kuwait, you get like 60 days of vacation, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Normally, I say you come back in like a month, um, but if you get 60 days of vacation, you come back in two months and you look at the water, and there's probably things growing in it, right? There's probably stuff in it. That's because the water was there long enough for things to start growing. At a simplified level, that's what we're doing on Mars. If we know that three billion years ago there was water on Mars, her job is to find out, was the water there long enough to have created an environment for life? And she has a, quite, a huge payload. All these instruments that you see are not just so, JPL built the rover, but that the instruments that you see come from all over uh, the world, from scientists all over the world. So we're back to landing night, there's me. And you can see why they made us all wear the same blue shirts this time. So I had been in this room in 2004 when we landed Spirit and Opportunity, but this time we were landing something larger. So that sequence of events that you saw is called Entry, Descent and Landing, or EDL. CNN calls this the seven minutes of terror. And that's because we were scared, right? We didn't know if this would work. We come in at 18,000 kilometers per hour. The first four minutes are spent bleeding off airspeed in the atmosphere of Mars. Then you fire a parachute supersonically, slows you down even further. And then you saw the last four panels show this series of events where the back shell falls off, then the, the back shell deploys, then the rover now, we're all, now we basically have the rover with like a jet pack on its back that's flying its way to the surface. The rover is deploying on a rope and the wheels are deploying. A lot of things are moving at once. Then you touch down, you sense that the acceleration is gone, the movement is gone, you cut the bridle and the descent stage flies away. Can you see how many things could go wrong with this, right? First time we suggested it to the NASA administrator, he said, uh, no, not with American taxpayer dollars, you're not, right? Think of something else. And so we tried. I mean, he was right. This was very risky. This is part of the reason that a government lab like JPL was given this job to do. Because a commercial company, it's too risky, right? They have to make a profit. It's too risky for a company. So they give it to a place like JPL. And we tried to come up with other ways to do this. And this was the way we had to do this in case, in, so that we could learn how to land larger payloads on Mars. If you're gonna send people, you need to be able to land large things. This reminds me of when I interviewed at JPL, one of the, the people I was interviewing with said, you know, the motto of JPL was, if it's not impossible, we're not interested. Right? It's our job to do things that seem crazy. So when you do things that are crazy, sometimes you fail. And that, but, and, you know, but you can do everything right and still have a bad day on Mars. But as you saw, not this day on Mars. Touchdown confirmed, we are safe on Mars. We are so glad, so happy when this happened. You know, Steve and Fred don't like it when I show this picture because they're crying, mm -hmm. right? And they didn't plan to. In fact, we had entire conversations and, uh, with our flight director about how we are going to stay in our seats. <laughs> we are going to clap politely. <laughs> we are going to be so professional, right? And this is what happened instead. <laughs> and so, and I had been through this before in 2004. I was sure that I was going to stay in my seat. Yeah, no. And so you might have heard Brian, the one who's pointing, say thumbnails, we have thumbnails. These images down in the bottom of the screen came in earlier than we expected. So it told us that not only was Curiosity on Mars, but she was healthy enough to send back images. You don't get a picture unless the rover is power positive, thermally stable and able to communicate, right? That she's gotta be healthy enough to send back these pictures. It did not feel like a robotic mission. It felt like we were there, like we were seeing Mars with our own eyes. When you land a big international mission on Mars, the president calls. So this was then President Barack Obama. He called us from Air Force One to say, good job for landing the mission. And then like anybody else, you gotta spend a little time being a tourist, right? That image 
I still remember seeing that image flash up on the screen. That is a beautiful picture of Mars. This was our new neighborhood on Mars. So what's the first thing you do, just like anybody else? You take a selfie. <laughs> At the end of our robotic arm, we have a camera. We turn the camera towards us. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and then it was time to get started working on Mars, to do what we came to do. So we have this incredible payload that, that uh, comes with us. So when we build a rover, or when India builds an orbit, or when, any, when anybody sends something to another world, they say, okay, what's the job? What are we trying to do? And in our case, we said, we need to find out if the water created conditions for life. And then there's something called an announcement of opportunity that goes out worldwide. And it says, okay, this is the thing we're trying to answer. Who has instruments that can help us figure this out? And any university, any institution, anybody can say, we have an instrument that will help, but it's competitive. You have to say, okay, you have to, you have to prove that in, order to, that in order to answer the question about the water, that your instrument will answer that question. And so we have, uh, like Dan is from Russia, Rem, uh, Rems is from Spain, ChemCam is from France, APXS is from Canada. So we have instruments that are literally from all over. And so those are the instruments. Now the scientists literally come from any, uh, all over. That our science team had, has 500 scientists. It's any university, any scientist that has the expertise. And then they apply to be on that team and then come be a part of it. This is uh, mission control at JPL4 Uplink for us deciding what we're going to send to the rover. So the engineers, like myself, we were sitting on this bench on this side. In the center are all the scientists. And you can see the data from the rover is up on the screens. And we're all looking at a screen over here that has the sequence of events we're going to send the next day. So we're all trying to decide, uh, the, so the scientists go back and forth and back and forth, and then they decide what they want to do the next day. Should we drive? Should we drill? Should we take pictures? What do we want to do, right? And then they decide, and the engineers are kind of like, yep, just tell us what you want to do, right? And like myself. So when they figure out what they want to do, then the engineers implement that plan. And we, so our job, think of it like if the rover is uh, like a bus, right? That we are responsible, the engineers are responsible for the bus. Right? The scientists are the ones in the bus taking all the pictures, et cetera. So the scientists are involved. And again, I encourage you to go to ASCC. The, in the Space Museum there, there's a wing for planetary science. That, that, those are the questions that are being asked. Then there's a wing of the museum for space technology. And that's the engineers making that, answering that question possible. So the scientists are all with us for three months because, so everybody's at JPL. And in this case, for other, for like if it's an ESA mission, everybody's at one of their facilities. But for us, everybody comes to JPL and everyone works together for the first three months. So we learn how to be a team, we learn how to communicate, we learn who everybody is, and then people go back to their home countries because you know, they want to be with their families, et cetera. So everybody's gone for three months, and now when we do operations, this room is much smaller. I mean, when I get back, I think I'm on duty next week, then we're in a much smaller room because now most of the people are on the phone that are doing the operations. And that is how we have to do this because it's literally worldwide operations. So this is where Curiosity is now. I love this picture. So the sky is this, uh, I, have a, I have a version in here um, where the sky on Mars is not actually blue. It's more of a red. But we found that the reason, that if we show the scientists a picture that looks, where, the, where it looks a little bit more like Earth lighting, they, 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 un, they can understand what they're seeing better, right? So, we, so it's a slight color change there. And so if you were, so the question was, was the water on Mars there long enough to have created an environment for life? Three billion years ago, if you had been standing there, you would have been standing in a river. Mars had water. Mars had rivers. Mars had oceans. I remember the day that our project scientists came into the, to the operations room and said, we're about to tell the press, and so we want to make sure everybody here knows first, and he picked up my water bottle. 
and he said the water on Mars was drinkable. If you'd been standing in that river, which probably would come up to your hips, you could have taken a drink. The water on Mars was pH neutral, it was drinkable. Mars was once much more like the Earth. It had water, it had oceans. Mars was once habitable. That is the big discovery of the Curiosity mission. Mars once could have had life. We have found the building blocks of life, the chemistry, but we have not found life. We have no evidence of life anywhere else in the solar system. And I'm not talking about little green men. <laughs> talking about bacterial life. The next mission, the Mars 2020 rover, is the one that will actually look for signatures of life. We have, I have to put this slide in because this mission is called InSight. She landed at Thanksgiving. So I was the proposal manager for this mission. I knew InSight when she was a piece of paper. <laughs> and now she's a lander on Mars. Can't believe it, I'm so proud of her. And her job is to find out are there earthquakes on Mars? Or Mars quakes? Get it? Because <laughs> they wouldn't be earthquakes if they're on Mars, right? So her job is to find out um, what the interior of Mars is like. Right now, there's only one planet. We know what the interior is like, and that's the Earth. So we want to find out about Mars. She just landed. She's doing her, um, uh, the team is doing their checkouts right now, so they're not yet ready to start taking science data. So we've talked about the evolution of a Martian. My team, we have long called ourselves the first Martians <laughs> because we live on the Earth and we work on Mars, right? Every day that we're on shift, we, we have had people living on the Earth and working on Mars. We've had a continuous presence on the surface of Mars since 2004. We've had people, my team, and the team that, as I went on to other missions that followed, where every day we come in and we go to work on Mars. This is all in preparation for human exploration. And this is what Ghanem was talking about, right? There's a lot of different steps. We're over on the science side, and we're also preparing for the next missions. How many of you have seen the movie The Martian? So all of you have seen the movie The Martian, you could go, you should go to ASCC, right? And, and the Cultural Center and see that. So in the movie The Martian, remember the oxygenator? So one of the instruments that I've worked on for the Mars 2020 rover is called MOXIE. It is a prototype of an oxygenator where we take carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere, pull it apart into oxygen and carbon monoxide. And uh, what day is today? Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Um, so Moxie was delivered to the rover about five days ago. So the instrument has now been completed and has been delivered to integration into the 2020 rover. So there are instruments that we are taking that will help us be ready for human exploration. Curiosity has the, has the first radiation detector on Mars. She's wearing a spacesuit. We don't know how to make spacesuits for Mars yet because we don't have radiation information. That is now coming back from the Curiosity mission, and so now the spacesuit designers have enough information to know some of their major requirements on spacesuit production. So when we talk about going to Mars, NASA expects to be part of an international mission to Mars in about 20 years. 2040 or so. There are other organizations like SpaceX, et cetera, who might try to go a little bit sooner, might be a little later. So, and when we talk about sending people to the moon, Mars, or the asteroids, we're talking about bases that are similar to what's going on in, Antar in, an, in Antarctica. Antarctica is a continent that is not owned by anyone, but we have had research bases in Antarctica for over 100 years. We've had people there. And these are not, there's not a, not a lot of tourists. These are small bases that many different countries have that are devoted to science and research and the engineers that support those bases. That's kind of the model that we have for what sending people to other planets would be like, is research bases similar to Antarctica. 
So we talked primarily about Mars, but we have missions around almost everybody in the solar system, exploration missions. And we've now gone beyond our solar system. This is a picture of Voyager. Voyager uh, was launched in the 1970s and is still going. Voyager is now outside our solar system. So we, as of this decade, are now an extrasolar generation. Something that humans have created is outside the solar system. When I started wanting to work on these missions of exploration at JPL, I wanted to be a part of something that benefited all of humankind. What I didn't know is that it would be the teams that made this rewarding. Again, I've mentioned I've worked on multiple missions to Jupiter, uh, outer solar planets, to inner solar, to extrasolar missions, and it's the teams of people that keep you coming back, that make these missions memorable. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. This is a picture of the Earth from Mars. Everybody you know lives on that dot. <laughs> this picture was taken by the Spirit rover. I was on duty that day, when we, and we snapped the picture, and everybody said, smile. Right? This is Earth from Mars. Just because you're interested in something that not everybody else is interested in doesn't mean you have to follow that path. For me, it was space exploration. But for you, it may be medicine, it may be literature, it may be art. I hope today we, I've talked a little bit about some of the people behind the missions. Don't assume that if you look at a career you th that you necessarily know what the stereotypes show you. I didn't know that much about robotic exploration when I first became interested in space. This is a remarkable time to be a part of exploration. There are so many planets out there, right? This is actually, and I think an, um, there, this is a, a new field of astrobiology, right? Because we've learned there are so many planets out there. This is one of the most popular areas for graduate students in astronomy now, is wanting to do extrasolar research. I'll finish with this picture. This is a picture from Apollo 8. I saw it when I was growing up. And for most people, for many, well, everyone, it was the first time they had seen a picture of the Earth from the moon, from the lunar system. I remember looking at it and thinking, I see no nations, I see no borders, I see no genders, I see no religions. I see one world, I see humans. This is one way to do something that matters. There are so many things that need teams of people to work on, whether it's science or engineering or medicine or law. Sometimes you are a part of something that is greater than yourself. If you're looking for a cure for a disease, it may not be you that finds it. You may do a piece that then gets followed on. I am a part of the chain of exploration. There are other missions, there were missions before what I worked on, and there will be missions after. Life is both personal, family, and professional. Think about what you want to accomplish in your professional lives. Do something that matters, work hard, come join us, we need you, thank you. Okay, how are we doing? 11.30, we have time for questions, yes? Yeah, have... yes? Uh, Salam Al Ablani, I'm the Director of Scientific Culture at KFS. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it was such a wonderful uh, experience to watch you explain all these complex processes. Uh, I can't remember how many times I've watched the clip that you showed about oh, the landing, the, the landing? Of, uh, <laughs> Curiosity. Maybe probably more than 20 times. I oh, was wow. captivated by the complexity of the process. But 
I also watched the landing of the Curiosity before it, the, the first. Uh, the this one, one was Curiosity. Yeah, the one before it, the one with the ball. Oh, yeah, Spirit yes. and Oppie. So how do you compare the risk? Because the, the, the complexity associated with the Curiosity was so uh, immense that there is bound to be a Murphy's Law somewhere there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, But the first one, I thought it was safer because of the you know, all the vibration absorption right. and whatnot. How do you compare the, the risk? Okay, so the question for those of you who might not be familiar with the background uh, was that the 2004 rovers, we landed with a different method. So for Spirit and Opportunity, instead of going, uh, instead of using the sky crane to lower the rover, we actually dropped the rover inside airbags. So airbags are those things that in your car they deploy if there's a problem. So we, we encased the rovers in airbags and then we cut the bridle, dropped them to the surface and they bounced, right? So they went bounce, bounce, bounce. Um, and so the question is, why did we switch to a different landing method? And is it more risky? And the answer is yes, we had to, we switch. It is more risky. But the reason we had to switch is the same reason everything ends up happening. It's because of the weight, because of the mass. The rover got so big that if we tried to put the rover inside an airbag, that we lost any weight and mass advantage. Sending things to other planets is always about that first step, getting off of this planet. That's where the most energy is taken. And so the airbag, the weight of the airbags to encase the entire rover, which is now bigger, about the size of a car, made that impractical. So that method works for smaller payloads, but not for larger ones. So we have to find other ways. Uh, to do things. Thank you for that question. Who else? Yes. Oh, there you go. Uh, so five, five days ago, maybe the uh, Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, directed NASA to take humans back to the moon. Yes. So how can future lunar missions or human lunar missions help us prepare to Mars missions, human Mars missions? So these things always seem to happen when I'm, you know, not at work. So I don't know as much about the direction, but the question of go to the moon. So as an engineer, so different administrations, different countries have different objectives, right? Like China's interested both in the moon and in Mars. And uh, so it's kind of the moon, Mars, or the asteroids. Those are close enough. There's a logic to what we've been doing, which is first we went to the moon and, and, you know, and, and had the kind of the space race, and then it was time to pull back and say, first we need to develop something reusable, not throw away our rockets every time. That was the space shuttle. Then we need to learn to live in low Earth orbit. Right, that was the space station. And then there is certainly logic to let's go to the moon because it's closer, right? If we're going to send people to be a more permanent presence than the moon, it takes three days to get to the moon. It takes seven to nine months to get to Mars. Days, months, days, months, right? There is going to the moon will undoubtedly help us learn how to go to Mars because we're, we, you know, it, you learn to live further away from the Earth. We can't, I mean, we can launch supplies up to the space station pretty quickly. They're going to be on their own more on the moon and then really on their own on Mars. So from an engineering perspective, there is logic to going step by step. Again, NASA is taxpayer money. And so if the taxpayers say, let's go to the moon, let's go to Mars, you know, we'll go where we are directed to go, but we try to point out that, so we try to develop technology that allows both paths. So, and I think you had a question during the presentation. I wanted to be sure to get back to that. Uh, yes. I was going to ask about the dates. Microphone, oh, yeah. Please. I, I can move this. We are recording this. Uh, I was just going to ask about the dates. Uh, you mentioned several dates. Uh, the last one, the, the, the one with the big celebration, it was, I think, in 2012. 2012, yes. Uh, but you mentioned 79, I think. 
1976. 76? Yeah, 77. What, what, what was in okay. 76? And there was in something in 97, I think? Yes. What, what's in 97? Oh, so, yeah, sorry not to give a clear picture. So we first started going to Mars in the 1960s, first sending orbiters. We first landed on Mars in 1976. That was the Viking landers. That time we tried to say, okay, we're going to send a big mission to Mars, and then we'll know everything all at once. Like we tried to figure out if there was life on Mars in the 1976 landing. And that's when we learned, wait, that was too much. We need to do this more step by step. We didn't, we got back what was basically an inconclusive data set because we hadn't, we needed to do the earlier work. And so then we spent uh, a number of years sending orbiters again to complete our data set. Again, not just NASA, these were, inter these were missions with partners. Then in 1997, we landed our first rover on Mars. That was Mars Pathfinder. 2004, Spirit and Oppie, 2012. Now I'm telling you about the rovers. We've had other landers land at the same time because we try to go every two years. But that was an important piece of realizing that we needed to go step by step, right? And when we talk about these, uh, the, I, I do want to remember to say that we're not talking about um, it, these missions. Each mission can be expensive, but we're still talking NASA is less than 1% of the U.S. budget. Less than 1%. And that's because, you know, the other amount of the taxpayer dollar goes to housing and medicine and, and uh, uh, welfare and, and, and all the other things that, now arts and all the other things that a society wants to spend their money on. But less than 1% does not sound like too much to invest in our future. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. You got to use the mic or they'll tell you to in a minute. Yes. Uh, hello, good evening or good morning. Uh, this is Chief Science Officer International, uh, Abdullah al -Gallaf. And I have a question about what's the goal to explore Mars? So the, uh, oh, I don't have to repeat it, you were on a mic. So exploring Mars twofold, well actually threefold, they all fall back into those same initial objectives. So one, understanding our planet, right? A surprise was that Mars is now, Mars was more like the Earth once. Right? That's not something we expected to see, and it highlights that we need to take care of our planet. Right? That was, that's part of that learn about our planet from learning about others. Second is the science objective. We're looking to see whether Mars had life in the past. And then the third is human exploration. We, we hope to eventually have people that are not living on the Earth. We actually already have people that are not on the Earth. For over 10 years, every 90 minutes, the space station goes around. And we have people who have been living off, the, off Earth for over 10 years already. So we're looking to extend that to Mars and to the uh, moon and the asteroids. You have a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, why we need to live on another planet? Like, we have the Earth and we have uh, a life here. And so, I have a, another question. If I, I want to visit an, another planet, okay, and uh, we are here Muslims, so we, need, we have five prayers to, uh, in each day. Uh -huh. So how we pr pray? Like there is, we have uh, to, to pray on the way to the Saudi. Right. So the second question of what are the... Um, the second question of what are the appropriate prayers for space flight, I do not know. As I, but I will tell you that on the plane, when I was flying, flying so Saudi Airlines, there was a, uh, they played yeah. a prayer for travel. Yeah. Seems like that would work, <laughs> right? But I'm not a Muslim, so I don't know what the, um, the appropriate prayer would be. The second is, why, why go to other worlds when we have our world? And, and one answer is, why not? Right? People have always been interested in exploring. And I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about, oh, we're gonna, no one's gonna live on the earth anymore. We're not trying to move life. We are trying to extend it, right? We're trying to say, well, we have people, who it's kind of like if you, if you were to go live in another country, it doesn't mean that nobody lives here anymore. We're trying to, uh, to explore other, we're trying to explore, and we've always done this, right? People have always gone over the hill 
to see what's there. And, and this is no different other than the fact that it's, you know, there's nothing to breathe and there's nothing to eat and there's, you know, so it's obviously harder than when we explore on the earth. But it's the same reason that, you know, you could say, why are we on Antarctica? For research, for exploration, it's a giant part of our world that is very hard for us to live on. But I, I don't think anyone can imagine just, okay, saying, okay, now we're done, right? It's not part of human nature to say, we're not going to explore. Okay, yes, in the back. Uh, first of all, thank you for this amazing presentation. I'm keep going to this ask, is how mic. did the opportunity live more than his estimated life? And why did he live that? So Oppie is a she, and, uh, and I should explain why that is. So the, we refer to all our missions as, as she because of naval tradition. So Navy ships were always referred to as she, and those are ships of the sea. So we continue that tradition uh, and refer to them uh, as she. So Oppie, why did Oppie live for 15 years? In, why was she functioning for 15 years? So, so um, Oppie and Spirit were, are solar powered. And we thought that they, their mission would be limited by the amount of dust that accumulated on their solar panels. We found out to our huge surprise that there are dust devils that run around on Mars and that actually act like car washes almost. So there are winds and periodically spirit and opportunity would get their solar panels blown off and cleaned off by these winds. So that, and so then once the solar panels weren't the limiting lifetime, we didn't know if it was the thermal cycles or what would be the issue. Then, uh, so she went way longer than any of us expected. I mean, way longer. You know, I remember when she landed and our scientists said, let's go to this big crater. And I said, oh my goodness, she'd have to live a year to do that, operate. And she, <laughs> she made it 15 years. So we are very, very thrilled. But last year there was a global dust storm. So um, Mar what happens is storms pick up on Mars. So there's dust on Mars that will pick up and turn into a, a storm. And Mars got hit by a global dust storm last summer. Curiosity was okay because she's nuclear powered. But eventually the dust blocked out the light so much that, oh, ugh, now that's me. Um, the, the dust blocked out the light from the sun so much that Oppie could no longer charge her batteries. And it lasted long enough, the darkness lasted long enough that she wasn't able to recover. We spent about eight months trying to contact her. And then when that didn't work, last month we declared end of mission for the rovers. But they'd really become a part of us, yes. Hello, my name is Yusuf Kendiri. My question is, is there any life in Mars in the future? So have we found evidence of life on Mars? Yeah, so we're, again, Mars right now is cold and, and dry and lifeless. We have no evidence of life on Mars in the past. We know there was water and we're starting to find the chemical building blocks. But in this business, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You cannot say you have found life unless you are sure. So the next mission, the 2020 rover, is going to take samples. We'll do some analysis when we take samples, but the conclusion of the scientific community is we really need to bring the samples back. Just like when we brought the moon rocks back, we needed to, um, we, we were able to learn so much more about the moon. So the consensus is that we'll get the samples, then the next mission after that, we'll bring the samples back. Scientists from around the world will have access to the samples because basically in order to answer this question of was there life on Mars three billion years ago, we need the full horsepower of the laboratories on Earth and all of the scientists on Earth. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Do you guys have any questions here? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the rover. When it, la <laughs> when it landed on, on Mars, the other parts of it flew away. Where does it go? So the descent stage, sorry, I keep thinking this is a mic. Um, the descent stage flew uh, away from the landing site and crashed on another part of Mars. 
right? Not very far away, just about a quarter of a, you know, a kilometer away or so, and the or less than a kilometer. And the reason for that was we had to be really sure that the descent stage didn't land on top of the rover, right? Like, oh, we landed safely on Mars, whack, you know? <laughs> We get hit by the descent stage. So the descent stage did a divert maneuver to send it further away. And the other thing is we wanted to use up the fuel in the descent stage, right, so that the fuel didn't contaminate Mars. So we did a divert maneuver to get the descent stage away. And, uh, and yes, obviously, and one of the things we try to do is not li you know, litter Mars. Right, so we, we look at whether that's really necessary. Um, do we have time? Who's, uh, Adel, do I have a, f uh, a little while longer? Um, uh, for whatever it's worth, we also refer to curiosity in our culture in the feminine ten uh, tense because it's a vehicle, and vehicle in Arabic is fe feminine. Oh, there you anyway, go. Anyway, uh, <laughs> when. You're the world, Dr. Sarah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, when pictures are taken by yeah. curiosity, uh, how are they transmitted to Earth uh, to be recomposed again? Hmm. Is it by what microwave? Is it by so there are radio signals, and in and in general, so we have uh, multiple ground receiving stations. So the ones that we use the most frequently because they're the big dishes are in California, Spain, and Australia, and. Also, because of the amount of power it takes to send signals back, we could, in emergencies, have the rover beam the data directly home herself. Instead, what she does is she sends the information up to the orbiters. So that takes less power because they just send the data. They're still, you know, the orbiters are around Mars. So it takes less energy to send the data up to, Mar up to the orbiters, and then the orbiters blast it home. Oh, sorry. Bo how about both of you? And then, and, uh, we still have a few minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think that we're going to live on Mars after like 10 or 20 years? And even if we do, are we supposed to wear those suits like 24-7? Yeah, so that is an excellent question about if people live on Mars, which I think we will see bases in the next hundred years or so. Again, we're not talking about large groups of people. Colonization is different than research bases. Certainly there's discussion about colonization, and we could, but there are a lot of logistical issues to be solved, not the least of which is you're mentioning. So in, and you heard Gautam talk about EVAs. Right, so there's and and there's a reason that his experience followed the pattern that it did. So you would not be wearing a spacesuit 24/7 inside the habitat, similar to what you sh uh, what he showed you at MDRS. Is you would not need a spacesuit because inside the habitat would be the appropriate you know gravity and atmosphere for humans. If you go outside of the habitat, then you would need to wear a spacesuit. Right? That's why it's not like everybody's going to go, and off we go to Mars, right? Because it's not, it's not super hospitable, right? It's not the same. It's not a habitable planet. For us to live there, we would have to create the environments that we need. You had a question? Uh, I was just wondering, why exploring Mars? Why not other planets? Mm. And is NASA planning uh, to explore other planets? So we have explored every planet in the solar system robotically. And again, it's not just us. I think Europe has a mission to Ganymede that's coming up. Uh, there was also a mission to Mercury. I mean, again, many space agencies are sending robotic spacecraft around the planets. Mars and the moon and the asteroids are our nearest planetary neighbors that are more ha theoretically more habitable. Venus which is also very close, is like we haven't even, we can't, haven't landed on it. Venus is so hot and try, and you know, the atmosphere is so dense and the, and it melts, you know, it melts spacecraft as you try to, so there's a reason we're not like, oh, let's go to Venus, right? We haven't successfully landed on Venus because of the pressures, or pressures and temperatures. So the nearest planet to us besides the moon that we would consider sending people to is Mars. And on, so Mars has the possibility of human exploration and this question of what was it like in the past. Yes, in the white. Did you manage to get samples from Mars because you need to know what kind of soil you are going to plant in in the future? Ah, such a good question is learning about the regolith of Mars, the soil. 
we are, right now, we are looking at the soil. Uh, we're looking to, to find out again what its composition is to add to what we know about what Mars was like in the past. But of course, learning about what the, the, the regolith, the soil on Mars is like now, tells us something about whether, about how we can inhabit Mars. You can't plant anything in the Martian soil. It's dead. It doesn't have the nutrients to make anything grow. It's, it's, it's dead. Uh, it's dead material. So we know, similar to what you see in the movies, we know that we would have to grow our own food. A little bit like on the space station, they're experimenting with growing plants hydroponically. A number of the Earth analogs are about, can we, I think Biosphere 2 was like this, where we say, can we grow plants where they have nothing except what's in their habitat for two years, right? There are, there's a reason that Ghanim was, you know, as Ghanim was telling you, there's a reason for these analogs. There are so many things that we need to, um, that we need to know before sending people. Ladies, if I could ask you to hold it down just a little bit, thank you, because I'll try to get to, to all your questions. Um, and so that reminds me, one of the things I, I sometimes, we have so much to talk about is, so if you're interested, just like Ghanim said, you know, contact him for the Earth Analogs. If you're interested in this kind of work, and I'm not talking about necessarily NASA or space, just in general, getting a great, getting a good education is the beginning, and you all know that, right? Science, engineering, whatever area it is of interest to you. The next step to make you competitive in this global environment is to do internships, right? Internships help make you not just a piece of paper to someone. Rather, I'm actually, when I get back, I have to finalize the summer students that I want to hire for our project for this summer. And for me, if I have 20 resumes, right, it's the ones that have done internships that I'm going to pay attention to. One, because they've had work experience, they know what they're looking for, and also because I can pick up the phone and say, hey, John, did Susie work for you last year? And how was that, right? She's not just a piece of paper. So internships, work experience, in your universities, in your high schools, if there's a chance to get hands-on experience, some of, your um, some of your schools might have robotics teams, right? Those are a great way to get experience doing teamwork. I'm here at the invitation of the American Embassy. They have an entire officer devoted, the education officer, to helping you study in the USA. I mean, now, obviously that's the one they'll help with, but you know, UK, et cetera. So get, you know, getting some of this educational background, but also it's about working and working hard. Then one of the things that, um, that Ghanem has experience now in is, uh, I have a friend who's on the, a uh, colleague who's on the astronaut selection committee for NASA. One of the things that I was thinking about as he was going through is as you see, he was in, his group was in the habitat for two weeks. Right. If you're going to Mars, you're in, a, you're in that equivalent in space for seven to nine months. So now one of the things that NASA looks for, and it's not just NASA, that it used to be that for the astronauts, there was a certain set of criteria, you know, kind of the right stuff. Now, one of the things that NASA looks for is expedition experience. Expedition experience means they have some way of knowing that you're going to do OK on the space station for a year in a, you know, on a, on a journey for seven to nine months. Living in, in, a, in, in, in a tight space with a, the same group of people, that's exactly what Ghanem was talking about, we learn about that. We learn how people do in those situations. So people who have Antarctica experience, people who have Earth analog experience, people who've served on submarines. In all of these cases, you really don't want to put a bunch of people together for seven to nine months and find out after they've launched that they don't get along, right? So being able to get along to work as part of a team is a part of robotic space exploration as well as human. So sorry for that digression, but I wanted to be sure to remember to mention that. Uh, may I take a few more? Yes. So I think I'll probably take um, a few more questions until noon, and then I'll be around if folks have other questions. And there's many hands pointing to you, so go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, did they discover uh, a pure water on Mars? Have we discovered water on Mars? Mm -hmm. Did they? I uh, sorry. I, I, if, did I hear you? You asked if we if there's water on Mars. Now, currently. Now. Yes. 
Uh, there is not water in liquid form at the surface on Mars now. There's water ice at the poles. There might be permafrost a, a few meters below. But the key is liquid water. And so definitely not on Mars right now. It's too dry. It's cold. It's very different than it was before. All right. We'll take a few more in the center. Yes. Uh, how many rovers have landed on Mars until now? And did any of the rovers come back to the Earth? Ah, good question to, to uh, end on. So we have landed four rovers on Mars right now. They're all US ones. There have been other nations have tried and not quite succeeded yet. I'm sure that will change. And none of the rovers come back. They were designed for Mars. That is their home. It, it, we leave them there. Now, it would be nice if one of y'all would go get Pathfinder and bring her back to the Smithsonian for us. But other than that, they remain on Mars because there is no reason to bring them back. And Mars is the home that they were designed for. And then you had one. How do I become a, an astronaut as a Kuwaiti student, like as in general? Uh, so the question of how to become an astronaut. Now, again, the UAE, has, there are many different space agencies, right? Chinese are, have astronauts, Japan, Japan does. So the process of becoming an astronaut from your country is actually the same as preparing for other types of backgrounds, right? You want to get a science and engineering or medical background. And then many, the astronauts tend to fall into certain categories, right? Some of them are medically oriented because you're always going to need a doctor. Some of them are the, the ones who fly the rocket. So they, have, they tend to have a flying background. And then the other are payload specialists. They might have uh, like the, um, the Saudi astronaut was one who went very specifically because he was an expert in the payload. So. Sending people to say, space means they have a certain expertise, yeah. right? And the start of that is to, is to get a math and science background and, or, or a medical background, pursue what you're interested in in terms of research, and then go through the qualification process. And you'll see, like for US astronauts, most of them know how to fly. They're scuba divers. They have different areas of expertise. And so I encourage you to go online and look at what the applications have. But also remember that there are, there's room, one of the things I hope you see from this discussion is there are many ways to be involved in the space program without being an astronaut, right? And, and, and astronauts are, if you really feel like you have to see it yourself. For me, it was more important to go far than to see it with my own eyes, right? The, the rover's eyes were good enough for me because we were seeing brand new things. NASA and other agencies, where JPL has historians, artists, financial people, lawyers, graphic designers. There are, there are, don't think that if you're not a scientist or engineer, that isn't, there are many paths to what you're interested in. Okay, so I'll be here to answer more questions. Thank you very much, shukran. Okay, we would like to thank the U.S. Embassy for this opportunity. We would like to uh, thank uh, Ms. Nagin for being with us here, and thank you for taking the time and visiting CAFAS. Thank you all. See you in the next lecture.